Well, welcome to Vineyard Church Live. My name is Andy Mead. So glad that you could join us as we continue in our series, The Great Comeback. We're looking at setbacks to comebacks. I think everybody loves a great comeback story. We see a number of those in the Bible, people that went through incredible difficulties and they had a comeback. And we're going to be looking at one each week. Last week, we looked at Job, the incredible comeback that he had. And so today, we're going to continue with that same concept. But we're going to be talking about how to come back from a, a, a setback that wasn't your fault because that happens. Sometimes we didn't ask for it. We're in some kind of difficulty, some kind of storm that came into our lives because of somebody else's dumb decision, somebody else's sin, somebody else, uh, their choices, and we end up uh, being impacted by that. And that sometimes is worse. I mean, it's one thing if it's your own fault, if you can look to your own choice and you go, you know what, I made that dumb choice, that's why I'm walking through this right now. But it's like even worse when somebody else's decision. You know, I mean, some of you are, are going through a divorce or went through a divorce you didn't ask for, you didn't want. Uh, maybe you're going through a bankruptcy or some kind of legal trouble that you, it wasn't your fault. You didn't bring that in. Or it could be uh, you inherited something from your parents that is painful. Or it could be that you struggle with uh, identity issues or or, or, or emotional problems or mental problems because of some evil person in your past and they brought that in. And, and if that's you, I wanted to say, I'm sorry that that happened in your life. And when we have storms, setbacks, problems that weren't our fault, how do we get through that? Well, we see this amazing example in the Bible, specifically with the Apostle Paul. So we're going to be looking at Acts 27, if you have your Bibles, Open it up, because we're going to be looking at a number of those passages there within that one chapter. Acts 27, let me give you a little bit of the background as we drop into this. Paul was falsely accused of something he didn't do, and so he ends up becoming a prisoner. But because he was a Roman citizen, they were going to do capital punishment on him, and so he could appeal to Caesar, which means he would go to Caesar. Now, he had always wanted to go to Rome. He had always wanted to preach in the Colosseum because Rome was the biggest city in the world at the time. The Colosseum was the, the, the biggest uh, amphitheater at the time. And so that was his plan. That's what he had hoped. Now, he ends up going, but not, not like he had thought. He had hoped to maybe go and preach some sermons there, but instead he's going uh, as a prisoner because of this false accusation. He ends up being a prisoner. And so they put him on this this ship, uh, a prison sh- with other prisoners. It's a, it's a prison ship, and they're going to sail to Rome. Now, w- what happens is they stay in this place in Crete for too long. They have this long shore leave, and now autumn is done. It's going into the winter, and it's not a good time to, to sail in to, uh, to try to continue the journey. And Paul's in prayer, and he actually warns them. He says, do not try and attempt this because it's going to end up uh, bad for everybody. The ship is going to get wrecked. Many of us might end up losing our lives. It says the ship struck a reef and ran aground. It was repeatedly smashed by the force of the storm's waves. The ship began to break apart. So it's exactly what uh, Paul said. That's what happened to that ship. Paul actually is in three different shipwrecks, if you can believe that. Kind of incredible. But what we learned from this one shipwreck in Acts 27 is three key things that I want to look at. One is, what causes people to make bad choices? I mean, it ends up impacting us. They make bad choices, and we end up suffering the effects. What do you need to know about setbacks that weren't your fault? I mean, how do, you, how do you navigate that? How do you get out of that? We learned that from this story for sure. What do you need to remember when your storm and you feel, you're in a storm and you feel hopeless? We tend to feel doubly hopeless when, again, it's not our fault. We feel almost like a victim. Here we are. How do we get through that? And we find these answers in this passage. So let's look at that together. What causes people to make poor choices that lead to setbacks or storms that we're in? Well, when we listen to ungodly advice, ungodly advice, people that don't know the Lord, people that are far from God, they're just making it up. And some of them are smart. And so they have 
all of this advice and uh, their, some of their arguments seem to make sense and they offer it out. But ultimately, God has the final say and we want to be leaning into God's advice so that we stay out of storms. That did not happen here. It says, much time had been lost and the day of fasting had passed, so by now it had become dangerous to sail because of the fall weather. So Paul warned the sailors with this advice. Man, I have perceived that our voyage is going to be disastrous. So he's prayed, and now he goes out and he publicly says this. You shouldn't be going. If we sail now, we'll lose the cargo, the ship, and likely our very own lives as well. So did they listen to Paul? Well, no, of course not. Of course not. It says, but the Roman officer in charge of the prisoners didn't listen to Paul. Instead, he followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. So there's other experts. You'll always find some so-called expert out there if you're looking for one. And people do that all the time to rationalize something they already want to do. They just keep looking, uh, Googling until they find some advice giver, some so-called expert who will agree with them, and then they that becomes their platform. But it is always the best decision to do what God says. To do If God says do it, regardless of what other people say, you should be doing that. And that certainly is something that these guys did not do. What causes people to make poor choices? Well, when they, lead on, when they listen on godly advice, also when they copy the crowd. The majority rules. I mean, so many people, they are influenced by the majority. If lots and lots of people are doing it, if most people are doing it, oh, it must be right. That certainly impacted the decision that these guys were in. Then the crew decided that they should go ahead and sail up the coast of Crete. Why? Well, because the majority. The majority wanted to spend the winter in Phoenix and it had been a nice harbor. It's funny how people still want to spend the, the winter in Phoenix. Sharon and I are going next week to spend a few days in Phoenix. But obviously that's a different Phoenix. The Phoenix in Arizona doesn't have a harbor. But here it's the majority. The majority. There's 276 people on this boat. Three of them are saying we shouldn't be going. One of them would be Luke. He's the guy who wrote Acts, is wrote the passage we're looking at. And that there the are two companions of Paul. But the, all the rest of them, 273, say we should go. And the majority, but the majority, history shows, is often wrong. Uh, often wrong. Certainly we see that as well in the Bible. For example, the 12 spies that go into Israel. Moses sends them in. Ten come back, say it's a no-go, it's too dangerous, they're too big, it's too difficult. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, say, we can do it, we can do it. Who do they listen to, the Israelites? They listen to the majority, they listen to the ten, and that ends up causing them to have to roam for 40 years in the wilderness because they listened to the majority. When you listen to the majority, you ignore the voice of God, you ignore what God's saying, it will cause problems in your life. And then when we rely on circumstances. Now it's dangerous to rely on circumstances because circumstances change so quickly. They can change so easily. And so rooting your decision making in circumstances can be certainly very faulty. That's what happened to them when a gentle wind, so it's looking good. Doesn't matter what Paul said, doesn't matter anything else. When a gentle wind began to blow to the south, the crew thought they had obtained what they wanted. That's all they were looking for. They were looking for something to substantiate what they already wanted to do, regardless of what God was saying. And their plan would work. So they pulled up the anchor and sailed as close as possible to the shoreline of Crete. So they're thinking, hey, we're going to go regardless of, of uh, again, what Paul said, what God's saying here. It's because of circumstances, because it it looks good. It, it, people use that excuse all the time. It feels good. It must be right. It feels good, so uh, that's all that matters. Uh, that is not all that matters. Just because it feels good, just because the circumstances are good, if God says don't do it, it's the wrong thing to do, regardless of the circumstances. Instead of trying to get our endorsement by ungodly counsel, or we're trying to get it through uh, the crowd, you know, the majority, or we're trying to get it uh, through circumstances, looking around us. It says, but shortly afterwards, so it changes. Circumstances change that quick. The weather changed suddenly, and a wind of hurricane force came out of the northeast and blew the ship out to sea. So this becomes this beginning of the storm that ends up lasting 
14 days and they end up wrecking the ship because they ignored the advice that Paul had given. God said, hey, don't do it. They did it anyway. So when you find yourself in a storm that wasn't your fault, what what can you learn from that? What do you need to know about storms? Well, one thing is that storms can cause me to drift from my goal. Uh, You know, I have a goal. I have things that I want to do, and certainly you do. And storms can kind of come in and they cause us uh, to, uh, we can get off course. COVID has done that to many of us, where that wasn't for most of us, right? That wasn't our fault. That wasn't something that we had anything to do with. And yet it's a storm we're living through. And for many of us, our goals, they just got ditched. We just threw them out. Well, I can't accomplish the goals I have anymore. And this is one of the temptations that can happen in a storm. Notice it says the ship was caught in the storm and the wind was so strong that they could not sail against it. So it's just like, hey, they, what's the use? They can't even, uh, they can't control it. So they lost all control. So they stopped trying. They gave up and let the wind drive them, drifting in every direction. Five things we see, five temptations that happen when we're in the midst of a setback, a big setback that was not our fault, a storm, here they are. One is, is we feel like we've lost control. We just give up. We stop trying. Uh, they, they gave up. Let the wind drive them. We're no longer purpose-driven. We're pressure-driven. We're living in, 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 in an urgent zone and reacting and, and instead, of, instead of planning and then drifting in every direction. So these are the things that we need to be careful about when we're in the midst of a storm. Here there is a desperate attempt. It says the crew tied ropes around the ship to try to hold it together. The storm is so bad, I wouldn't even know how you would do this because it's just unrelenting. But somehow they get ropes out and get it to around the ship to try to keep it together because they feel it's going to just pull apart. Now, none of this would have happened if they had listened to Paul in the first place. But here they are. They're in a storm. Uh, it's raging around them, and they're in this desperate place putting ropes around. You know, I think that's what happens to us. Certainly when we find ourselves in a major setback, something that's not our fault, we start looking for band-aids, looking for ropes, anything to hold it together. Sometimes those things are not all that helpful. Uh, they're kind of just desperate attempts. Instead of really going to what is helpful, which we will see what Paul did. That is what is helpful. Uh, Number two is is they cause me to discard what I value. When we're in a storm, when we're in a big setback, we tend to reevaluate our priorities. Now, certainly that can be a good thing. I mean, if you go through a major health issue, you can come out with a new priority of valuing your health. I did that. I was uh, I was significantly overweight. When I was in my 30s, when I turned 40, I came down with this terrible, terrible uh, asthma condition. So bad that, I mean, it, I was immobilized. I was literally just, I, I slept and lived day in, day out in the living room because it was close to the bathroom. And I was, I was in a, uh, uh, just a, 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 a couch there. I would get up, go to the restroom, come back. And I would go, and that would just, just going to the restroom would put me into a coughing spasm of 5, 10, 15 minutes. I was gasping for breath. I felt like I was uh, drowning. This went on for weeks. I was going to the doctor, getting shots of cortisone. I was on an, an inhaler, steroids, everything. I mean, I'm just in this terrible spot. And then it caused me to evaluate, you know, I'm not in shape. Uh, I'm overweight. I've, I'm not taking care of my body. And so I determined in, the, in, the, in, that, in that storm that I was going through to start changing things. And I did. I started putting it. I had to change my priorities. I, I, I just had to make it happen. And then, thank the Lord, the asthma completely resolved in my life. Now, I know that doesn't happen for everybody, but for me it did. But it caused me to reevaluate to prioritize and change things. And so that's positive. Sometimes, though, we do the opposite. We get rid of things we needed in our lives. We get desperate to change things. 
It says the next day the gale force winds continued to batter the ship. The crew began throwing the cargo overboard. So they start that. This is going on for, for two weeks, as I said. The following day, they even threw the ship's equipment. <laughs> That's the stuff they needed to operate the boat and anything else they could get their hands on. Eventually, they end up throwing themselves overboard. I mean, it goes from the cargo to the equipment, their very own lives. They're in a place of discarding things uh, and, and reprioritizing their, their, their life. So not only do we discard what we value, but we causes us to despair. That's the last thing to go when our hope is kind of swallowed up. It's so dark. It's so, uh, the future is so gloomy. We don't see anything good coming and we lose uh, to despair. It says the terrible storm raged unabated for many days. It was 14 days, blotting out both the sun and the stars. They can't see anything. It's so dark. Not only can they not see anything at night, but it's also so dark they can't see anything during the day. No stars, no sun, no compass, no sextant. They don't have anything to give them any kind of sense of where we're at. They're just being tossed around uh, on this raging sea in the middle of the storm. And it says, in, in, in the dark, and we finally gave up all hope. That's, I mean, they just, they, they just threw in the towel. It's all over. We don't see any hope. Now, what's interesting is this is not Paul's perspective. Paul has peace through this whole thing. He knows God's at work in his life, and he knows God's going to get him through. And so Paul has a totally different view. These guys, they're clamoring, doing what the tying ropes around. They're trying all kinds of things. Paul, though, has a different uh, attitude and perspective going through the very same storm that they're going through. And we can have that. We can learn the, th the things that Paul did and put those into our life so that when we're in a storm, a storm that's not our fault, we can get through. So let's look at that, the, things, the three things that Paul had. Before we do that, though, I want to just tell you about a Christian symbol that's been around really before even the cross. We all know about the cross as a symbol for Christianity. There's also the fish. You may have heard of that. The fish, the Greek words for fish stands for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. And that's called the ichthys. It's, it was a uh, clandestine way, a secretive way that Christians would communicate to each other during uh, times of great persecution in the early church. But before the fish, before the cross, was the anchor. The anchor, because it, was, it actually goes to this verse that talks about anchoring ourselves in Christ. Here's an example of one of the early uh, anchors that they found, the archaeologists, and it says, we have this hope as an anchor for our souls. Great, great example uh, because we're talking about storms and you need an anchor when you're in a storm. And I want to look at the three anchors that Paul had that helped him to have, not just make it through the storm, but have faith, hope. He, tr he could trust. He had a different perspective uh, and peace in his life when everybody else was going crazy. Here it is. Three anchors to remember when I feel hopeless. What, number one is the presence of God. Knowing that God is with me. I'm not in this alone. Paul knew that. He knew he wasn't in the, on that boat all alone. He had God with him. He was communicating to God. He was talking to God. So we remember God is with me. He has not left. Here's what Paul did. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, men, if you had listened to me, now he's talking to the sailors, the crew of the, of the boat, you would have avoided all of this injury and loss. But, so he's not just going to stop there. He goes, but take courage. He goes, hey, this isn't my fault. I understand. It is your fault. But, hey, God's not done. God's not done with this. You can take courage. None of you will lose your lives. Even though the ship will go down, the last night, and for last night, an angel of God stood by me. He goes, an angel, in other words, God's presence is here. He can feel him. He's, God's talking to him. He's connecting with him. There is something very powerful when you're in a storm and you sense God's presence. Over the years, from time to time, I would go into a hospital to visit somebody who is very ill, maybe on their deathbed, all kinds of, 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 of visitations. But one of the things that I like to do, Sharon likes to do it as well, is as we go into a hospital, especially if we're going to stay there for a while, we turn on uh, worship music. We want that hospital bedroom to be transported 
into a holy place where you sense God's presence. God's there, and it always changes the environment. We don't ask the nurses if it's okay or anything. I mean, we just, hey, this is, we're going to do this. We, know, we need to feel the presence of God, and there is nothing like that. Now, sometimes it's hard to feel God's presence. That's why it's good to have worship music. That's why it's good to have somebody reading God's Word, or, or you, you have uh, somebody like on Audible, or however you hear it, you know, a voice that, that doesn't irritate you, where somebody's, you know, you hear God's Word being read, maybe the Psalms. There's a lot of great things that can just pick your spirit up, having God's Word, God's the worship, uh, you know, having prayer. We put prayer in our small groups, not because it's just a nice close and uh, as an add-on. It's an integral part of sensing God's presence. So we're always looking for prayer, worship, God's word. So we feel there's something powerful when you know God's standing with you. God's there with you. That's one of the anchors that Paul had. Also, he knew about the purpose of God. God's purpose was bigger than any storm. No matter what he's going through, no matter what's, whether he caused it or somebody else caused it, God's purpose is greater than, he's going to remember that. Remember, God's purpose is greater than any setback or any storm that I find myself in. Now, notice what the Bible talks about. It says, God's angel said to me, it says, don't be afraid, Paul. For you will certainly stand trial before Caesar. In other words, his purpose never changed. He wanted to go to Rome, to the Colosseum, to give his testimony to Caesar. None of that. He's still going there. It's different than he had expected. He's still going to be able to go and give his testimony to Caesar. His purpose, even though other people try to throw you off God's purpose in your life, you can even make your own dumb mistakes. God integrates that stuff and continues his purpose in your life. It's incredible. It's good news, certainly, when you're in a storm to remember God's purpose never changes. Don't be afraid, he says, I will certainly stand before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone else sailing with you. How, does he know, how are they getting there? Not on their decisions, not by what they're doing, but by God's faithfulness through Paul. Through Paul's faith. Paul's contributing in a powerful way in what seems so chaotic, so uh, despairing, and he's injecting hope and faith into the situation. And then thirdly is the promise of God. Do you have the presence of God, knowing God's with you? He's standing there. He's in it with you. No, also, the purpose of God. That doesn't change no matter what happens. And God's promise. God's promise is something we can count on. Remember, God's promise can be trusted. It says here, so keep up your courage. Again, Paul's talking to the sailors. He says, men, for I have faith in God. Not faith in the captain, not faith in the pilot or the centurion. He goes, no, my faith is rooted in the Lord. My, my faith is in God that it will all turn out just as God had promised. So God's promise is not going to change. Nevertheless, we are all going to first be shipwrecked on some island. So notice uh, the, the boat's still going to get shipwrecked. That hasn't changed. And, and, and even, though, even though their lives will be saved, sometimes we are looking for everything to be saved. But you know, sometimes that's not the case. We lose our job, but God's he goes, I'm going to protect your life. God's all about protecting our lives. You might lose things along the way. Certainly they lost the ship. But God says, I'm there with you. I'm going to make sure you're okay. At one point, the sailors tried to abandon the ship, thinking their lifeboat would save them. But Paul said, you'll, you'll all die unless you stay with the ship. So the soldiers cut the ropes and let go of the lifeboat. So here they're trying to do some kind of desperate attempt to save things, to gain some kind of sanity, some kind of control, a man-made lifeboat. And we all try to do that when we're in a difficult place. Some of us have made our lifeboat uh, around something that can be taken away from us, something we can lose. Maybe some people build their lifeboat out of their appearance, their good looks. Other people out of their money. If they have a big enough pile of money, maybe that'll be a lifeboat for them. Other people out of their athletic ability or out of their acting ability or some other kind of uh, ability that they have. And, and they build into that and those things we can lose and they become lifeboats. God says, hey, you need to cut 
that stuff away. There's nothing wrong with it per se, but when it becomes our lifeboat, our security, our identity is built into that. We're hoping that's going to get us through the storm. God says, that's not going to do it for you. You need to trust in God's promises. Then Paul said, please eat something for your own good. Now, they hadn't eaten in a long time. We find that out later. Uh, So he says, hey, you're going to be doing some swimming, so you're going to need to eat something. For not a hair of your head will perish. Then he took some bread, gave thanks to God before them. He does this in front publicly. He, he prays over the meal. And, uh, and then they eat it. And everyone was encouraged. You see, by his recognizing God's promise, God's faithfulness, blessing the food, it, 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 being positive, injecting faith into it, everybody is encouraged. We can be, we play a big role in a storm. A storm like COVID, a storm like uh, that you might be going through within your own family. People are watching. And, and when we inject faith and we step and stand on God's promises and we say, hey, I'm going to trust in God's presence. God's purpose isn't done. God's promise is strong. We're going to encourage people around us. When daylight came, the officer ordered those who could swim to jump overboard. So here is the great comeback that happened. All along, Paul's at peace. Paul knows God's going to come through. Finally, they all get to see it. Uh, And and so those who could swim, they jump in overboard and they swim to the island. The rest grab pieces of wood from the broken ship to float on. I think this is interesting how they have, they have, they have, one translation says they have boards. I can't prove this, but my guess is that Paul's so fired up that this all's overdone with as he's coming in on the surf on his board. I'm guessing Paul just momentarily got up and stood on his board and surfed in. So this is, uh, this is probably the first surfing that ever happened in history, and we see it right here in, 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 in the Bible. I can't prove that, of course. But everyone made it safely to shore. That's ultimately what God wants to do is his through their storm, regardless of how it came your way. Whatever you're going through, God says, I'm going to see you through this. I want you to trust in me. I want you to trust in these three areas. This is what Paul did. Trust in God's presence, regardless of how you feel. Trust in God's presence. God is with me. Trust in God's purpose in your life, that you were made for a purpose. He has a purpose that he has for you that he's not going to give up on, regardless of what happens, regardless of the storm. And then trust in God's promise. God has a promise that he is going to see you through this and that you will make it safely. Let's bow our heads and pray. Wherever you're at, if you would, just maybe bow your head, close your eyes, whatever you feel comfortable. Just get in a posture of of going before God and say, God, I need your help. Especially if you're in a storm, that is the prayer for you. You go to God and say, God, I need, I need help right now. I'm in a storm. I didn't cause it. Or maybe you did have a part in it. You just, but you say, God, regardless of how I got here, you say, God, would you help me? Help me not to rely on ropes and lifeboats and, and, and these desperate things that we see happened in this story. You say, God, right now just say, God, I want to anchor my life, and these three things that we see that happened in Paul. He had peace. He had faith. He had a calmness about him throughout this whole storm because he knew that you were with him. You say, God, right now in your prayer life, just, in your, just you can think it, you can whisper it however you want. Just say, God, help me to sense your presence, to know you're with me. Would you say, God, today, I want to declare, I know you have a purpose for me. And you're never, ever going to forget that, forfeit it, regardless of what I do or what others do. Your purpose stays the same for me. And you'll integrate other people's poor choices, my own, into it in order to continue to further what you're doing. You'll get me there. Just like Paul ended up getting to Rome, it looked different. He still was able to go to see Caesar, but it looked different. But it's per- your purpose never changed in his life. Your purpose never changes in my life. And then when you say, God, I need your promise, the promise that I will be saved. If you've never put your faith in Christ, claim that promise right now. You just go to God in prayer and just say, Jesus Christ, thank you for coming on this earth, living a perfect life, dying on the cross for me. Would you do that right now? Just say, God, you died for me so that I could have a fresh start. 
so that I could go through storms knowing you're with me and you have a purpose for my life and I can stand on your promises. You say, God, give me a fresh start. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I certainly am praying for all of you who are going through storms. Let me know about it if you're in a storm. You need people to stand with you in prayer. We have a prayer team that would love to pray with you. You can just text us, 704-5504. Just type in pray, and then let us know how we can be praying for you. If you ask Christ into your life, you are saying, today's the day I want to receive Christ. I want to walk with God. Let me know about it so I can pray for you. Uh, you can type in same number, 704-5504. Just put in no God. If you're on Vineyard Live, there's a way for you to respond as well there. Just say, I prayed to receive Christ today. And we want to know about that. We're, we're not going to show up at your doorstep or anything like that. We just want to be praying for you and let you know what your next step is because we all have a next step. And we want to see you uh, grow in your journey as you trust in the Lord. If you'd like to s support what we're doing and invest in, in God's work uh, through Vineyard Community Church, uh, 45777, and then put in VCC, that's our group code, and then the amount, and, uh, and work with us, team with us as we change the world together. Okay, the Lord bless you. Can't wait to see you in week four of The Great Comeback. See you next week.